Thank you, Bill, for that lovely introduction. And thank you also to you and your wife, Penny, for generously underwriting uh, today's panel. Very much appreciate that. <laughs> so um, my name's Emma Belcher from the MacArthur Foundation, although I'm doing this in my uh, personal capacity right now. I'm supposed to say that. Um, and we, I'm here with a terrific group of panellists, uh, so thank you to each of you for uh, coming here to Chicago for the Humanities Festival and sharing your thoughts. I can assure you from the time I've spent both on the phone in preparation for this and a couple of minutes in the green room, this is going to be a fascinating conversation. So I think we're in for a real treat. And thank you to all of you as well for your interest in this topic and for coming here today. Um, I'm sure at least some of you have uh, become more interested with the recent HBO miniseries Chernobyl. Uh, it's um, certainly um, quite a series. It's uh, won 10 Emmys, including for Outstanding uh, Limited Series. And certainly um, I found it quite, quite compelling. Um, at times I did have to hit the pause button and go and do something else for a little while. It got quite intense. Um, but um, what we're here to talk about today is, you know, how Hollywood was this versus reality. And this is my first question for the panellists here today. Um, how well did HBO do in really depicting the reality versus what maybe they might have got wrong? Adam, I'll start with you. Uh, I think that if it had been one of those things where they say inspired by real events, then, then it would have gone over a lot better with me. Um, because it, it, uh, it kind of drove me crazy to watch it, to be honest. Um, I mean, particularly because a lot of the work I did on the book was to debunk a lot of myths that had grown up around the accident since 86. Um, and, you know, it, it sort of reanimated a lot of those myths and then created new ones. So, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the one that gets me particularly is the idea of the bridge of death. You remember the bit where all these citizens, many of whom uh, their relatives work at a nuclear power plant, they get up at two o'clock in the morning and they get their kids dressed and they put them in strollers and they take them out so that they can watch a nuclear power plant burning. Um, that didn't happen. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a popular myth because it, it caters to what, you know, people might expect to happen in the case of a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union rather than what, you know, really happened. Um, and then there are other things about it like uh, the naked miners, for example. So, you know, the writer of the show said, well, I, I understood it was very hot in those tunnels, so it made sense to me that they would work in hats and boots and nothing else. <laughs> um, you know, and I can't say that that didn't ever happen, but I, I, the people that I spoke to who did work in the tunnels, I, I would have thought that they might have mentioned that <laughs> at some point. So a touch of Hollywood there, maybe. Quite a lot of Hollywood. Yes, I mean, yes. obviously the broad sweep of it, there was a nuclear accident, it was terrible. You know, that, that happened. <laughs> Terrific. Kate, what's your perspective on this? And you've done a lot of research into what actually happened. Yeah. Um, I, I did a lot of archival research in addition to talking to, you know, several dozens of people. I worked in about 25 archives for this story, this book I wrote. And what's really amazing about the HBO show, and I was laughing as I was watching it, is that a month after the accident, the Soviets issued a, a, a set of regulations. This is how we're going to cover the accident. We're going to lionize the firemen who are altruistic Soviet patriots who are giving their lives to save the world from a worse threat. And we're going to talk about how, how fantastic the Soviet government can mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to solve this problem. Um, and we're going to talk about how we've got the, the, the radiation safely contained within the Chernobyl zone. And, and we're going to finish the, close the chapter on, on Chernobyl with the, uh, um, the trial in the summer of 1987 where they blame, where they scapegoat the plant operators and blame it all on them. And that's what Mazin did. Like, he followed the Soviet um, blueprint to the letter. And that really cracks me up because as I was working through the archives, I found that um, the framing of the accident in, tr in chronologically very limited to just, you know, a couple months, you know, the ticking seconds of the accident, the blow up, and then a couple months afterwards, and then framing it within the Chernobyl zone 
is to, it's like watching a James Bond movie and turning it off before the shootout. Like the, the real drama occurred outside of the Chernobyl zone where the radioactivity went. And it, and it played out for years and years and years. And in fact, to this day, when we eat wild organic blueberries that circulate the globe that come from areas around Ukraine, we're eating Chernobyl radioactivity. It, you know, this story hasn't ended. Um, so let me give you an example. There's one slide I, I'd like to show of a map. A um, couple days after the accident, the Soviet um, meteorologist noticed that a big storm front was, was going to blow, and it was blowing northeast towards the big Russian cities, including Moscow. And this was going to you know, churn out all this radioactive fallout in those cities. So they brought, sent out pilots, and the pilots went up and they uh, seeded the clouds so that radioactive fallout fell on rural Belarus rather than urban Russia. And you can see from this map, down here is the plant in the lower um, you know, section, and, and you can see these angry red spots. That's right where the, you know, the accident occurred. The pilots let, let up over the big city of Gomel, about a half million people, and then they let it rain. The only problem with this triage operation is they didn't tell anybody in Belarus about this event, not even the leaders of the Belarusian Communist Party. So people lived in that area with terrifically hot levels of radioactivity until it was finally depopulated in 1999. Now we have a lot of journalists and tourists who like to visit the Chernobyl zone, but the second sort of unknown Chernobyl zone, no tourist ever goes to. And, and that's where the real drama played out. Fascinating. How about you, Greg? What were your thoughts? Well, I, I didn't actually watch the series, so. Um, All right, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, partially, um, uh, partially because I, I dealt with a nuclear accident, a, a more recent nuclear accident, and I thought I would have kind of an atom type response where I am watching and, and, and seeing things that just don't seem real and, and realistic. My, my old job, I was the head of the US Nuclear Regulatory uh, Agency. And in that capacity, um, I was deeply involved in the most recent nuclear accident, which almost rivaled really Chernobyl in terms of severity and, um, and consequences. Uh, but it was very different, and one of the biggest differences really was it was happening in a kind of modern democratized nation, Japan, rather than what we think of as you know, the Soviet Union and the government and, and cultural uh, characteristics that go with that. So, it is very interesting as, as I was working on my book, I actually did some research just basically to look at the accident a little bit. And you know, there were so many common themes and threads about what happened there that were similar to what happened at Three Mile Island in the United States as well as then in the more, most recent accident at Fukushima. So you know, what I find interesting through all of this is just how much consistency there is in the chaotic nature of the accidents, the um, you know, we, we can talk about you know the challenges with the the, um, the seeding uh, and and and, and uh, this effort to try and control radiation. The same thing was happening in Japan. They were very very concerned about impacts in Tokyo. Now there were no discussions about seeding clouds, but there is a there is in fact a very significant area of radiation deposited. Uh, northwest of that plant in Japan, and that was largely because there was a large uh, rainstorm that washed down radiation um, in that particular area. So, you know, there's so many commonalities to these accidents, whether it's Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima accident, through my island here in the U.S., that, you know, it, it is amazing to me that when they happen, they do happen with a lot of degree of similarity. And, um, uh, you know, and I saw from the inside the government reaction and the challenges managing this kind of a large incident in a modern, you know, industrialized nation like Japan. Thank you. And just to stick on that for a minute, do you think there are lessons that should have been learned from Chernobyl with respect to Fukushima that didn't get learned? Um, or are there things that have come out later where people wish they might have known something but for various reasons uh, didn't at the time? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting how in this country we reacted to that accident at the time. And largely the accident was dismissed as being irrelevant for uh, the U.S. nuclear fleet. And that really, w w in many ways, was the most significant reaction from my perspective. Um, and you have to remember this accident was coming seven, seven years um, on the heels of the Three Mile Island accident, which was 
uh, an accident, the first major accident with US-based reactor technology, and it didn't release radiation, but it had a chaotic government response, chaotic evacuations, a number of similar characteristics is what, what you saw. So at that time, there was, the industry was just recovering from that accident, and then Chernobyl happened. So the reaction was really to just dismiss it as a product of a foreign technology. There are technological differences between the reactors used there and the reactors we have here, or even in Europe at the time, Western, Western Europe, and as the product of a foreign culture and a foreign government and a restrictive totalitarian government. And I think, again, if you look back, that that was a missed opportunity because there were elements of that accident that we should have taken better heed of. Uh, now, of course, part of the challenge was getting information. It was a long time until the Soviets even acknowledged that the accident had happened. And you know, one of, our, I think, the most interesting stories is how really um, evidence was determined that, that the accident was happening, a confirmation of it. And it happened, there was a nuclear power plant in Sweden. Um, and power plant workers were going into the plant, and all power, nuclear power plants, you have to, you have radiation monitors to make sure you're not taking radiation into the plant so that when you leave, you have radiation, they know it's coming from in the plant. Well, as they were going into the plant, the radiation alarms went off. And radiation signatures are very, very unique. They're like fingerprints. So that was public confirmation that, in fact, there was this accident happening. They were able to trace back the origin of it and have really public proof that this accident was happening. So, um, you know, there, there were a lot, a lot of things that I think could have been learned, and, and I think it's one of the unfortunate aspects of the industry, in particular in this country, that there was an unwillingness to learn, because confronting the realities of another accident so soon after Three Mile Island would have really been difficult and would have, would have forced the country to go through an, a reckoning about nuclear power again that I don't think um, certainly the industry wanted, nor really a lot of um, uh, power players in Washington and other places. Did you have something to add there, Kate? I do. Please, yeah. go ahead. Um, it, it, I wanted to second what Greg is saying. In 1987, a year after the accident, there was a meeting of health physicists in the United States and near Washington, D.C. And these are people who deal with nuclear medicine. And they were addressed by um, a lawyer from the Department of Energy who said the biggest threat to nuclear right now are not accidents or not you know, new technologies, it's lawsuits. Um, and at the end of the Cold War, all of these archives were opening up in, in Great Britain, in the United States, in France, revealing the, the record of exposure from the production and testing of nuclear weapons. And so they had a, a breakout panel where they trained, they said to these you know, health physicists, you know, you, we're gonna train you to be expert witnesses in court to defend the US government against lawsuits. So they, you know, they appear in court as, as objective scientists, um, but they're, you know, they had these breakout sessions where they trained them. And I think one of the problems we have with Chernobyl is that we didn't learn from it. So that, as, as Greg's saying, that Fukushima repeated many of these mistakes. Um, by 1990, Belarusian health officials and Ukrainian health officials were, were, were clamoring loudly saying, we have a public health disaster on our hands. And they went to the UN to ask for help. Uh, they had kids with cancers. They had all, uh, a big jump in uh, birth defects and people with autoimmune disorders, respiratory system disorders, disorders of the circulation and endocrine systems. And they, you know, they had all these records showing this uh, that they had tracked for, for you know, four years at that point. And they went to the UN, the UN said, the General Assembly, you know, they said, okay, we'll have a, a pledge drive and we'll raise about a billion dollars in today's money for a long-term health study, a lot like the Hiroshima studies, you know, the, the lifespan studies of Hiroshima survivors. But then some guys from the international, some administrators from the International Atomic Energy Agency, another branch of the UN, uh, got wind of this, and they said, well, we'll do our own study. Um, and they did a, you know, I, they spent about 18 months, they sent in, you know, 200 scientists on and off, and they came away with the study that said, you know, we saw a lot of sick people in these contaminated areas, but nothing that could be um, from Chernobyl exposures because the doses are too low compared to Hiroshima. Um, meanwhile, they had in their hand biopsies given to them by the, by the Belarusian Ukrainian doctors of kids with thyroid cancer. And they took those, you know, a guy named Fred Mentler, he took those um, biopsies home to his lab in New Mexico. They all checked out, and he forgot to add them to the report. 
And so that pledge drive failed. They, they raised less than $6 million out of that billion. And so we don't have a long-term study about what happens when people are exposed chronically to low doses of radioactivity. And that is something that's far more pertinent. We, we hopefully will never have a nuclear war with big bombs blowing up, but we probably will. We have had nuclear spills in the past, and we probably will have more in the future. And so this is something we critically need to know if we're going to invest in nuclear power in the future. Is it safe to get, to you know, ingest in your food long-term, you know, low doses of radioactivity. Thank you. Adam, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard as well. Um, and um, you've also spent a lot of time interviewing people um, from Chernobyl and um, what is, has their reaction been to both the series but also all of the discussions surrounding what actually happened and um, the lack of information and um, medical issues since then? Uh, <coughs> the TV show, I mean, I only know about the, you know, some of the individuals that I had contact with when I was researching the book. Um, and the best example that I can give you is, is that the daughter of Valery Legasov, who's, who's ostensibly one of the heroes of the TV show, um, uh, who I met and, and interviewed about her father and provided me with a lot of material about him and his life um, and growing up in that household. Uh, and after the TV show had screened, she sent me a WhatsApp message that just said, shame on you, because she mistakenly believed that I'd been in some way involved in it. And she was so upset by the way that her father had been depicted that that's, that that's what, so I had to try and put her straight about this. But I never got an idea of what specifically it was, but that's, that's, a, you know, that's the guy who's supposed to be the hero of the show. Um, and I know that, that uh, you know, other people who are featured in the show, the real people who are, who are, who are featured in the show, um, who worked at the plant were extremely upset with it and started trying to get together a petition to send to HBO to register their protest. Um, but I think that's partly because they just, you know, a lot of the, the, the characters in the show just conform to Hollywood stereotypes. And they're not, you know, they're all, I mean, there's one character who, who is portrayed as so kind of uh, uh, simplistically evil that at some point you expect him to dash out of the control room to tie a young woman to some railroad tracks and start twirling his stuff. Um, so, it, I mean, I, I think that, that that bothered a lot of people because obviously, all the people that I spoke to um, who are protagonists in the book, uh, you know, they're like real people who have you know, shades of black and white in their characters. Nobody is, you know, nobody is quite such a simplistic, you know, uh, callous apparatchik. Nobody is quite such a simplistic victim of the socialist system. Um, and that was something really that, that I was at great pains to kind of report out when I was working on the book. Uh, which is another reason why, when I was watching the show, I was just like, oh, really? Did you, you really have to do this? Um, but, I mean, the, 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 I think the biggest impact of the kind of lack of information that, that Kate's talking about is that, you know, it, it, people who suffered through the accident and who were affected by it are kept in this constant state of, of uncertainty. You know, so many of them, so many of the people that I met and spoke to you know, suffer from these weird clusters of symptoms, but nobody can directly connect them to, to potential exposure from Chernobyl. I mean, partly because of the kind of complexities of, of epidemiology, but partly because, you know, their records were either falsified or lost, or, you know, there's, there's one woman who, um, who worked inside the zone for a year after uh, the explosion and was there on the day of the accident and oversaw the evacuation. Um, and she found that, that her medical records were marked with the, the same statement that Soviet doctors are instructed to put on people's medical records, which was uh, whatever their illness, if it wasn't acute radiation syndrome, was to say ordinary illness not related to radiation. Yeah, and the, I, I say, I mean, the, you know, and, and the, the you know, these kinds of things are happening in real time right now in Japan. They're struggling with how to deal with exactly this situation where there are about 100,000 people who, or over 100,000 people who were evacuated as a result of the accident there. And 
right now they have a very extensive program to monitor uh, various types of, of cancers in children and adults. And so they are struggling with this very situation because there is an uptick. And it's not clear yet whether that uptick is the result of lots of people not coming forward to get diagnose, to get treatment or to get diagnostic treatments that they would otherwise not have. Um, and their illness is becoming observed because of that or whether in fact it's an actual result. And, but nonetheless, the people are, they're, they're anxious, they're frightened, they, they don't know what's happening. And it's one of the real challenges. And again, this is happening today. It's not happening um, you know, years ago in, in, in the Soviet Union. So the, these kinds of issues still are real and, um, and, again, are very challenging and difficult when you have these accidents. It's, you know, you don't have detailed understanding of what people's radiation exposure is. We have lots of maps. We had folks from the U.S. government who would go and fly over and take measurements. We have all kinds of detailed maps, but what somebody in their home was exposed to, you don't really know. And so it makes it difficult, and people come forward, and I think I, the first official uh, reimbursement has been made or for an individual in Japan who is officially a victim of the accident. And you know what that means, it's, it's really unclear, but it means they're getting compensation from the government. Um, is their illness really directly a result of the accident? It, you, you can probably never know. Um, but it, you know, it could be, and it, it could possibly not be. So it has a very personal impact on a whole lot of people, the accidents have. Um, and it's certainly a very sort of um, emotional issue, controversial um, debate about nuclear power is polarizing at times. And there are debates, I think, right now in various countries, including the United States, about how, whether nuclear power is worth the risk and whether it's um, a very important contributor to achieve climate goals um, or whether it's far too risky. So I'm kind of interested in each of your perspectives on um, you know, whether it's necessary to achieve climate goals or whether um, it's something that even if it would be helpful is far too risky. So Adam, I'll start with you. Um, I, I think that, um, and I know that some people are surprised by this when they read the book, but I think that um, I continue to think what, what I suggest in the book, which is that, that given the scale of the climate catastrophe in which we currently find ourselves, and you know, reading the paper last week, by the middle of the century, Shanghai, Ho Chi Minh City, and, and Bangkok are all gonna be underwater. And we're, you know, we're way behind the, the place we need to be in order to reduce carbon emissions, in order to address this stuff. Um, you know, I think that to, to adopt a sort of fundamentalist position and say all nuclear power is, is terrible and we immediately need to close all of these plants, you know, that would be pretty irresponsible given where we are at the moment. And given the fact that certainly in the closing stages of reporting the book, at that time, the predictions were that, that global electricity use is due to double by the middle of the century. So not only have we got to reduce carbon emissions, but we've also got to try and make more electricity to, to keep up with rising demand in the, in the developing world. Um, so I think that, you know, although nuclear energy in, its, in the past has certainly, you know, caused these terrible problems and the, the consequences are appalling, um, you know, it's, it's worth considering whether it's worth, worth the risk and thinking of it in in scientific and less emotional terms, because it's kind of, it is a, it, it has been turned into a very emotional argument. And, you know, I, I think that people should just look at the science. Thank you. Kate, do you agree? Uh, no, I don't. Um, and, and not, I mean, I've, what I found in my book is, as I said, a, a public health disaster. Um, you know, the official number is 300 people were, were hospitalized. The, the archival count is 40,000 were hospitalized in the summer after the accident from Chernobyl exposures, 11,000 of whom were kids. I mean, it just goes on and on. The, the record goes on and on. But not just for that reason alone, um, for pure economics um, and for uh, Temporarily, how much time do we have? We need to solve the climate change problem today. And, and in the course of this week, we could put solar panels on this roof and, and, and they could float some wind turbines out in the lake. And, and in the windy city, you could generate a great deal of electricity. 
Um, but if you try to put a, a small modular nuclear reactor on, on Michigan Avenue, I, I have a feeling that would take 15, 20 years, and, but probably never happen because of all the people who would be upset about that because they're worried about the risk. So I don't see, I mean, if we're gonna replace fossil fuels with nuclear reactors, we'll need to build 12,000 nuclear reactors. There's 400 on the globe today. That's a big scale up. And we won't wanna do it in a hurry and we won't wanna make mistakes. Um, so my colleagues in nuclear engineering at um, MIT um, have made these models where they see that they can, um, re renewables can produce about 96% of the electricity that we need, and that the, the last 4% would be great to have nuclear reactors for the days where it's not sunny and not windy and, you can't, and renewables can't do it. And then the question is, do we want to invest all this extra money in, for infrastructure and, and the extra risk and the extra cost? Nu nuclear power is about twice as expensive as renewables right now. Um, and renewables will probably go down in price. So I just don't, I don't see the economics um, and the time skills working out for nuclear power. Thank you. Greg, what's your view? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I was um, to a large extent where Adam was for a long time. I mean, I was heavily involved in the nuclear power industry as, as the, the head regulator. And, you know, I saw the challenges certainly of the technology, but also appreciated that, you know, I think climate change is the biggest it's an existential threat I mean, for the planet. And so I, I, I was for a long time kind of in a conflicted mode where I where had seen the consequences and recognized that this is a, a technology that, while most of the time it's fine, when it goes badly, it goes badly, very badly. And more importantly, societally, it's very, it, it causes great trauma and on societal scales in a way that we don't usually see from energy technologies. Usually it's, it's the kind of trauma we see from large natural disasters, from wars. Uh, you know, if you think about these kinds of effects that you're seeing, whether that's right or wrong, that's what happens. So, uh, you know, I, I, thankfully, we are in a very different place today than we were even 10, 15 years ago. Um, when in this country in particular, the nuclear industry was engaging what they described as a nuclear renaissance. Um, I was the chairman of the NRC at the time, and we had at, at that time in 2009, uh, we had about 30, we had 18 applications for 30 new reactors. We have about 100 reactors in this country. Um, so the industry felt that it was time they could kind of begin building reactors again, and four of those reactors were licensed. Uh, today, it's a very, very dismal picture. Two of the reactors that were under construction were canceled because they were significantly over budget. The other two continue to be uh, constructed in Georgia, but the cost is just beyond the scale. I would argue with Kate that the nuclear is probably 10 times more expensive than renewables today. It's probably not double. Um, so, you know, we are in a place in which there are alternatives from a carbon perspective that not only are cheaper, but they're faster and can be deployed in a way that, um, you know, doesn't take all this time and you don't with the exception of large hydro projects, you don't have the potential for societal catastrophic uh, events. So I almost would say that I, I think it's a false debate I, I, or a false question. I think the question isn't anymore about a balance of res risks. I think we don't have to even address that issue anymore. I think that's a thorny question and I prefer to avoid, avoid it if I can because I don't think there is a, a good answer. I think Adam's right, you, you just can't take it off the table. But in fact, economically, I think as Kate said, it's just not an option. It's not an option from a time perspective, and it's not an option from a cost perspective. So I actually you know, look at this the other way, which is in fact, people who talk about nuclear as a solution are actually doing a disservice because nuclear cannot be a meaningful contributor to carbon reduction in the next 10 to 15 years. That's the typical lifespan or construction period. So as Kate said, if we were to ramp up for significant global use of nuclear power for climate change, we're talking about today starting construction on thousands of reactors all over the world. That is not happening. Whether, you know, when we can argue about why that is or, or debate that and talk about that, but it is not happening. And so there is no way within the next 10 to 15 years that nuclear will be a significant contributor. And moreover, in most countries with established nuclear programs, the number of reactors is decreasing. In this country, we're actually down uh, 18 reactors compared to just uh, uh, seven years ago when I was chairman of the NRC. 
Um, some of those have been replaced with gas plants. Some of them have been replaced with renewables. And so really where the competition is is between natural gas and renewables. It's really nuclear is not in, in, in the energy sector, the electricity sector, nuclear is simply not an option right now. But there are alternatives. That's the good piece, the good part of the story. And those alternatives are cheaper and deployable faster. Thank you. Um, Kate, zooming out a little bit, what takeaways do we have from all of this, Chernobyl, Fukushima, about governance and risk and society and technology? Yeah, I mean, the, the theme of this uh, Humanities Festival is power. And I think it's important to think about the kinds of energy sources, the sources of power we have, because they relate to the kinds of societies we build. The energy sources aren't neutral. So if you have a power source that's located behind cyclone fencing, guarded by guards, um, all the records are off limits because it's either proprietary information or that um, plant can be weaponized into a dirty bomb or a site of a terrorist attack, we don't have a lot of transparency. Nuclear power doesn't really lend itself, and we've seen this in the history of nuclear power, whether it's building nuclear weapons or civilian power, we haven't seen much transparency. Um, when there is an accident, whether it's in the democratic United States, the authoritarian Soviet Union, or the in-between Japan, we don't see officials rushing to tell us what's going on. In fact, we see officials covering up, lying, hiding evidence, and hiding data, and it's really easy for them to do because of the security measures that are in place. Um, we wouldn't have that with solar power. Um, we wouldn't have that with, with wind power. Th those are not, they were not constructed as bombs, and they don't, you know, aren't potentially weapons. So I'm about to head to the audience for questions, so be thinking about what you might like to ask, and we'll have someone go around uh, shortly with a microphone. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask the panelists before we do, what do you think everybody in this audience needs to be thinking about and what can they do if they're concerned about this? Well, you know, I think one of the most important issues, and Kate mentioned the word power, and that from my perspective conjures up a lot of different uh, concepts. I worked in Washington and so I, had a lot of experience with political power and you know, what I saw working at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, working on Capitol Hill, was the influence and the tremendous influence that business interests have. Um, and you know, I saw it directly in the nuclear power industry. And the nuclear power industry is a very, very powerful lobby. I mean, they're powerful here in Chicago. Exxon is one of the largest uh, nuclear power uh, uh, companies in the country and really almost in the world in a way. Um, and they're very, very influential. And that impacts everything that, um, that happens when it comes to safety, when it comes to regulation, when it comes to oversight. Because those industries have influence with Congress and Congress ultimately has influence with the regulators, whether it's you know, in nuclear power, whether it's in food safety. And what we're seeing today is a movement away from oversight and regulation towards more industry self-regulation. And that's happening in the nuclear sector, we see it happening in the, tra or the airline sector, the aviation sector. Um, I actually flew on a, this is probably a little bit off topic, but it's, I see these trends everywhere. I flew on a 737 MAX the day before they grounded the planes. Um, and I, I was on a flight, or no, it was the day of. I was on a flight on a 737 MAX, had a layover, saw on my phone that the second accident had happened with the 737 MAX. And, and I said to my wife, and it was with my kids, and I said, they have to ground that plane. They will ground it. It will take them a little bit of time, but they will ground it. And I saw so many similarities with that incident and nuclear power, that what you had is fundamentally a bad design. They designed the, they put the engine, they wanted to keep the plane as close to the way it used to be as they could, but they wanted bigger engines to make it more efficient. And so they didn't change the overall design, and they because of the way the 737 is, it's very close to the ground. They had bigger engines. They had to move them more forward in the plane. Well, when you do that, you change the aerodynamics of the plane in a way that it made it behave badly in certain situations. So they do what always happens in these technological industries is they, they the expression we would use is sharpen your pencils. Right? Everybody goes out and tries to analyze and say, well, it's fine the way it is. Yeah, it wasn't the way we started, and we knew it wasn't good that way, but 
we're now going to do a more refined calculation to show that it's safe, or we're going to put in a system to fix everything when things go bad. Well, that's what they did with that, which is the his that's the way nuclear power plants work. The nuclear power plants have fundamental safety problems, and the way you fix them is you put a system in place to address those problems when they happen. Well, those things eventually fail, and that's how we get access. But what it comes back to is, at the end of the day, we are in a period right now in which the industry, nuclear industry, is struggling financially. So their activity right now is to reduce regulatory burden because it's expensive to make their plants more competitive economically. And that's acceptable because of this power, not the electricity power, but of the political power in the political system that we have. So, you know, there's one thing I would like you to know is to be aware of that and, you know, what you do with it, I guess that's up to you. But, um, but I, I think people need to understand that that's what we're seeing uh, right now and it's happening in nuclear, it's happening across many, many sectors. Um, the one thing I'd like you to know is to think about insuring a nuclear power plant. There's some minimal insurance, I'm sure Greg could tell us more, but there's something called the Price-Anderson Act that was passed in the 1960s which uh, indemnified the nuclear power companies so that if there is a big accident, corporations don't pay for it, the taxpayers do. So that's, what, that's a situation where we sort of privatize the profits and we socialize the risk. I, we're not for socialism in this country, right? So, you know, try, and, and this Price-Anderson uh, Act has been duplicated in European countries around the world, and so we see this, you know, TEPCO just says, claims bankruptcy, Japanese government is left with a huge price tag. Uh, the Soviet government's price tag for Chernobyl was so high that the, Gorbachev said that's what killed the Soviet Union was that Chernobyl accident. Um, so though that's the kind of calamity we're talking about, and it, it you know the, the burden falls on taxpayers, and we're seeing that right now just with the decommissioning of plants. We've got. Um, the, where I live near Boston, there's a Pilgrim um, nuclear power plant in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and there's another one out in California um, between LA and San Francisco, the San Onofre plant. They're um, storing this radioactive waste in um, these steel canisters, and, and both sets of steel canisters, because there is no, our nuclear waste in America is homeless. It's one of the many homeless subjects of this state. And that waste has no place to go. So we're storing it on the coast. Uh, there's an earthquake fault near the, you know, it's sort of a, a, a crisscrossing of earthquake fault lines underneath the San Onofre plant. And there's all these new, more powerful storms that, near Boston that, with these northeasters. So that's where, that's our solution so far is to not have a solution for nuclear waste. Uh, I guess I would just kind of back up what you both said and say that what, what you could do is is ask questions and make sure you're well informed because you know the history of a lack of transparency and secrecy and expediency in the nuclear industry globally uh, is terrible and 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 that has fed into you know a lot of of justified and unjustified fear of nuclear energy um, so I guess that would be my answer thank you very much all right questions so my colleague John and I will bring a mic to you. Just be sure to speak into the mic. Um, pose your question as a question and try to be brief so we can get to as many people as possible. Um, I'll start over here. If you don't mind passing it down, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, having grown up in Chicago, in Hyde Park, where the first nuclear fission happened, the site is now marked by Henry Moore, uh, we gather every August 6th to remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I have so many questions because I've been going out there every year, and you're all welcome to come. But um, nuclear waste, with all the brain power we have, why haven't the scientists focused on that? That's my first question. <laughs> but I also want to direct you to a local Illinois um, grassroots organization, the Nuclear Energy Information Service, that just last week circulated a call for action to, um, there are a couple bills pending, and I hope I get this right, um, in, this, in the House, there's the Nuclear 
uh, Waste Policy Act of 2019, the, the amendments that they're going to try to push through. They're looking for $23 billion. Well, the, so, so the question is nuclear waste, and, and uh, I'll stop there but, there, but do pay attention to the House and the Senate. I have a feeling Greg has a lot to say about nuclear waste. Uh, but I'll just say one thing really quickly, and that is that um, the Atomic Energy Commission oversaw the production of, of nuclear weapons in this country and also the introduction of, of nuclear power plants. And it only occurred to them after you know, the beginning of the first Earth Day, after the environmental movement got off in the 70s, to create a, 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 a branch uh, you know, in, the, in the flow chart of the Atomic Energy Commission for nuclear waste. That was 1975. So they had been operating for several decades. So that means that in all these production sites, nuclear production sites around the country, they had to go back in the 90s and figure out where is all that plutonium? Where do we dump all that waste? Because they had left it to the corporations. The corporations said, you know, butt out of our private business. We'll take government contracts, but then just leave us alone. And so they had left them to the job of nuclear waste. And, and so we don't really have many solutions. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a fundamental physical process. You know, I think the original question is why, haven't, why hasn't technology gotten kind of on the issue of nuclear waste? I mean, the problem with nuclear waste is it, I, I used to work for a senator from Nevada where there was an attempt to make a nuclear waste repository, and he fought that. And he used to give a speech, and he would say, you know, it's the most dangerous substance ever, ever made. And I would try and tell him, well, no, it's probably those are persistent organic pollutants because those don't ever degrade. Nuclear waste does eventually, naturally, through physical processes, become benign. It takes, for a lot of material in, in, from a nuclear reactor, it takes 100,000 or more on the scale on the order of hundreds of thousands to a million years. So it's a very, very long time. Um, and there's not a lot, there are things you can do. That's basically the, the way I like to think about it. If you want to speed that process up, you have to put it into another nuclear reactor. That's essentially what you have to do. You have to create another nuclear reaction that will make that material decay faster. Um, that's hard to do. So you know, there really isn't a technical solution. It, it is fundamentally material that has to go through a natural process of decay, and there's just not a lot you can do because we can't change the laws of physics, so to speak. So. You know, it is a problem. It is something that is often, you know, not talked about. Um, and, you know, I, I'll just give you one quick anecdote. I had a conversation once with a, a group of um, power, uh, nuclear power CEOs, and we were talking about this issue. And, I, you know, I said to them, well, you know, explain something to me. You have a nuclear power plant in your community, which you're very proud of, and everyone in that community is very proud of, maybe many people in that community. And these uh, nuclear power plants are often in very rural areas. And, you know, the mayor is very proud of the plant. It brings a lot of revenue in. The people who work in those plants, maybe, you know, an operator nuclear power plant without a, a high school, with just a high school degree could make $100,000. Um, and people love your nuclear power plants. They hate your nuclear waste. And you and I know that the nuclear power plant is far more dangerous than the nuclear waste is. So why don't you just go explain that to them? And they said, well, we can't do that. Um, and, you know, that's part of the problem is that this material is there. They didn't want to explain the relative risk because the nuclear power plant makes money, the nuclear power waste costs money, and they wanted the federal government to do something about it, and the federal government has been stymied in trying to figure out a solution for it. So, you know, nobody stopped making nuclear waste and said, okay, wait a minute, let's take a time out, as my kids would tell me, let's take a time out and try and figure out what we do with this stuff before we keep making more of it, and we do. We continue every day to produce more nuclear waste that, as Kate said, doesn't have a home. Um, but it's, it's technically, it's just something you can't really do much about technically because this material just has to decay, and it'll take a long, long time because of the material that's in there. Um, or, like I said, there are some ways you could use nuclear reactors, but those are just not feasible to, to try and speed it up, but you're still left with stuff that's gonna be hazardous for you know, for a long time. So, quick sort of follow up on that. Um, you see, you know, it seems to be there are technical challenges, but political ones as well, right? And you see some countries in Europe, some Scandinavian countries in particular, that have figured out ways to um, 
sort of even entice people to be interested in hosting nuclear waste in repositories um, near their um, in, near their towns. Um, is there something that they're doing that is not happening in the United States to the extent that you're familiar with with, with that process? Yeah, the, the difference is just one of scale. We have hundreds of reactors, they have five reactors. Uh, so it, it's just the volume of material. It's, it's a very different volume of material. And, um, and I think that makes that makes all the difference. The, the scope of the solution is so much smaller uh, that it's, it's, you know, it's, they're making progress in a way, but no country with a large nuclear power program is even as far as the United States is. You could maybe argue that they haven't gone through failure yet, which is what we've gone through in this country, and I think that's a necessary step in a nuclear power program or a nuclear waste program. You have to fail with your effort to then try and figure out the right way to do it, and maybe somebody will figure that out. But, um, but I think really it, it's Finland and Sweden that have, it's just the scope. They have much, uh, they have, uh, you know, 50th of the reactors that we have, 10th of the reactors. Thanks, Greg. The next question. Let's go right over here. Uh, thanks very much for a great discussion. Could you comment a bit about the inner connections between nuclear power and uh, nuclear weaponry? I mean, I, I think we know the history, how they, you know, one was meant to be kind of a beard for the other, let's say. But uh, looking forward now, what can we think about these two things separately, or are they too closely connected? Historically, they're very closely connected. Um, you know, the first industrial-sized reactors were to produce plutonium. The Americans and the Soviets uh, made those, built those in the 40s. Um, then they made other different kind of reactors to power nuclear subs. Um, so the Chernobyl reactor was one that was one to produce plutonium. And so they took military reactors and, and plugged them into turbines and generated electricity. The Americans, you know, Eisenhower in 1953 said, announced this program, Atoms for Peace. We're gonna, we're, they got tired of the Soviets saying, you guys have the Marshall atom and we have the good atom. So they, he created this program, but they didn't really know what that meant. That was kind of a propaganda line. Um, so then they started to think, well, you know, the Soviets are plugging in, you know, the, the first power reactor. Um, we better do something quick too, or we're going to get you know sort of a propaganda loss for this. So they took a, a sub reactor and plugged it into turbines, and and that's what we have. We we don't really have um, we have military reactors that are plugged into turbines. We don't have specifically designed uh, reactors that are necessarily safe for communities that are you know sort of fit for this civilian project. Although those are the generation of reactors that are being worked on now, isn't that correct? The new reactors are, yeah, they're, they're trying so to come the, up with new reactors. So for the first time, there are actually programs to try and build nuclear reactors that are specifically built for generating electricity, which is like the first time anybody's bothered trying to do that since 1942. Um, but as you say, it may be too late for that now. I mean, you know, I would just add, I think one of the areas where, you know, the the way I describe it is that the difference between a commercial program and a weapons program is largely intent. That there's a lot of overlap between the technical know-how, some of the technology um, for the material. And obviously, building a weapon is a military aspect, but getting the material that you need for a nuclear weapon, that process is very closely related to doing things that you do for a nuclear reactor. And so, you know, you look in the Middle East in particular right now where these lines are very blurred where you have programs in Iran that, you know, ostensibly are commercial reactor programs. Um, others believe that they are weapons programs. You look at Saudi Arabia, which right now has been a little bit more candid, I, th I believe, in talking about how they have an intention to develop a commercial nuclear reactor program. But I think they've even acknowledged that that is largely to build up technology to have uh, a hedge against uh, a, a continued weaponization of the Iranian program. So. You know, there's not a lot of difference in some aspects even today um, between the commercial programs and the weapons programs. It is largely just based upon what intent is, and um, and you know, intent is hard to monitor. Uh, right over here. Hi there. Um, so here we are sitting in what is arguably the most nuclear power dependent state in the country for electricity generation, and at least one of you 
um, maybe more, has spent time at MIT, which is a center for nuclear fusion. What opportunities are, or where are we with nuclear fusion? What opportunities are to possibly transition or move the nuclear industry towards nuclear fusion? My understanding historically of nuclear fusion is that it's like that song, it's always a day away. <laughs> so there's a great Soviet film, uh, uh, one, uh, uh, what is it, one, uh, one day, nine days in one year, and, um, and it's all about these, it's a 1961 m movie, and it's all about how these scientists are on the cusp of producing nuclear fusion, 1961. Uh, so that's a little bit in the past. So um, Greg can tell us more about where the technology is now, but it, it seems like, you know, they're talking now that it's about, what, 20 years out? They're projecting? It's typically 30 years. Uh, so. <laughs> it's not going to solve our immediate problem. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's, all, it's, a, it's a shame in a way that they both use the words nuclear because they're very, very they really are very different technologies. Um, and very different physical processes that are that create the energy. They both happen at uh, essentially in the nucleus of the atom. That's why they're nuclear. But they're very very different. Um, and the, you know the joke is is that every year fusion is thirty years away, uh, and that's still largely true. Um, but I think one of the things that's changing, and in, in not in a good way for fusion, is. is um, I think just as we're seeing with you know coal and nuclear fission, you have to start to ask why do we need nuclear fusion anymore? Right? We really have done a tremendous amount to harness renewable resources to the point now where these technologies are extremely cheap. They can be deployed on a mass scale, coupled with storage technologies. You basically can now, which you know, are getting cheaper as well, faster than we can speak you're now developing kind of the ideal energy system. And that energy system is going to be built around these technologies. So nuclear fusion in 30 years is not going to fit in this kind of an energy system. So, and it's again not clear that it can meet the economic realities of what we're seeing today. So, you know, it's, it's unclear whether at the end of the day fusion will, you know, whether it, we are actually able to develop it from, just from a purely technical perspective and then generate the energy and then harness the energy, which is the challenge. How, once you generate the energy, how do you turn it into something usable like electricity? It's not as simple with fusion as it is with other things. But once you do that, will it actually be economically competitive? Uh, you know, that's an open question and one that we may find in 30 years. It, it just isn't. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to explore it. I think we absolutely should. But, you know, I, I'm not, you know, convinced anymore that we really need a savior for energy anymore, that we have a lot of good things today. And, uh, you know, they do a pretty good job. Terrific. Well, we've got um, quite a few more questions. So why don't we sort of group three at a time so we can get through a, a number of them. Um, yeah. We'll take three from the other side of John's side for the time being. Uh, my, oh, my question is, uh, has to do with power storage. You, step, you uh, started to talk about storage of power, but uh, I'm only aware of uh, the pumped storage up at Niagara Falls and uh, a, a, a trial with uh, liquid sodium. Uh, uh, what large scale power storage options do we have? Great, and we, we had one down here as well. No? Okay. And then we'll come to that side maybe after. Sounds good. Uh, we, uh, we, we used to use 10% uh, ethanol mandated in gasoline. Can you uh, recycle 10% uh, of uh, nuclear waste in the nuclear production until you get rid of it? Any more over here? Maybe just down the back there. With the I'll come around. Um, I just moved back to Chicago from Japan, and while I lived there, there was a real push to support Fukushima in terms of produce and all, all these different products. Um, but I'm just wondering if, like in a perfect scenario, you would leave the land like untouched, maybe no produce or agriculture, 
post-nuclear meltdown or disaster? Terrific, who wants to go first? I can take that last question first, because um, I've already forgotten the first questions. <laughs> there was one on recycling and the other <laughs> maybe storage as well. Storage, that's right. Um, you know, there, there's a, a recently marketed atomic vodka that comes out of the of rye, a field of rye that was grown inside the Chernobyl zone and the skies. So when people do that, you know, there's all kinds of abandoned farmland in Ukraine and, and in Belarus. And, and the Russian government is, in fact, giving, uh, if you want a hectare of land, if you're a citizen, they'll give you free farmland. So when people do that, when the people grow food in radioactive and contaminated zones that they know are contaminated with radioactive nuclides, it's a political statement. It's not really an economic process. You know, these, you know the, the atomic vodka guy is like, I'm trying to help these people. I'm donating the $100 for the vodka back to the people. You know, th that's a way of trying to normalize the accident, move on to the next chapter, and, and hope that because radioactive nuclides are invisible and insensible, that people will just forget. But ingesting you know, radioactivity isn't a great idea. Um, it, it, it lodges in, you know, depending on the, the radioactive isotope, it lodges in your bone marrow, in your heart, in your lungs, in your flesh, uh, in your thyroid. And it causes those organs to uh, function poorly and, and people start to feel poorly. I just came from a, a conference of uh, microbiologists who were talking about the microbiome and, and they see signs that radioactivity can um, mess up the gut, which is becoming, you know, like um, the, the microbiome of the gut, and which also causes people to, to feel poorly and organs to function poorly. What we've learned in the last 15 years of vaulting um, uh, advances in, in medicine and biology, um, especially in epigenetics and in microbiology, is that the body is part of the environment, that when we talk about a community, we're talking about a community in which we share microbes with all kinds of other agents that we share, that our, our bodies are quite, um, they're not hermetically sealed, they're quite porous, so that when we produce a lot of toxins, those come home to roost. But to be clear, these guys aren't selling radioactive vodka, are they? The vodka is slightly radioactive. The, the, the rye was more radioactive. You can look at the records, um, but they, they, through a series of expensive processes, they got it down so that it's only slightly radioactive. With cesium-137 is what they're counting. This is the guy, um, Jim Smith. He's, he's the, the, the only scientist that still remains who says that nature in the Chernobyl zone is thriving. A, a lot of people um, report that story. That's a story editors love to report, but I followed two biologists around the zone, the only two that are really working consistently in the zone since um, 2000, and um, they don't have that. They've published thousands, of, you know, 2,000 papers, and um, every rock they turn over, they, you know, Musso, Tim Musso says, we find damage into the ecosystem. Thoughts on storage and recycling? Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wrote um, re, the issue of, of um, the 10 percent, uh, I mean, in principle, uh, spent fuel that comes from reactors has in it usable, you know, the, what the phrase you'll hear is 95 percent of the spent fuel could be used again. So it's the same material that started out. So essentially what happens is you use the fuel in a reactor and you build in things that make it not work well anymore for generating electricity, so you can't use up all the, the fuel that's in there. So then you replace it with new fuel. So in principle, you can take that out. Con some countries do that. France does that. But you, you then have to keep doing that infinitely, and you still get really nasty stuff that comes afterwards. So you're always getting, you're always getting still left over the very, very long-lived things. Now, what people were trying to do is figure out a way to take those really long-lived things, put that back in a type of reactor. In fact, there was a group out of MIT that thought they had a solution to that, a new type of reactor that would do that. That reactor, actually, they unfortunately had to come out two or three years ago and say our calculations were wrong. In fact, we, this won't work. So, you know, there, it, it, in principle, technically, it's possible to do, but it's not something that's feasible or economically viable. Um, in terms of storage, there's a number of things you can do in storage. Battery storage, of course, is one. Battery storage is limited by duration right now um, to, you know, same kind of batteries in essence that you have in your phones. You can build big. Those can't last terribly long. 
um, but they work now, and they're good for a lot of things in the electrical grid, but compressed gas uh, is one way to do it. Um, uh, uh, you can do um, flywheels. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do, to do energy storage. And in fact, every day, people are coming up with better battery technologies. There was just something I just saw two days ago where somebody claims they now have a, a chemical process that they can use for a battery that will last for years. So, you know, that, that technology is continuing to evolve. And again, it's evolving faster than almost anybody can predict. And I think our obsession right now with batteries as the storage medium, I think, is going to be a passing fad that we'll look back on as almost silly, that we spent so much time and effort, you know, if Tusta sells you solar panels, they sell you a battery to go with that, may or may not be necessary in, in the long run. So the final few questions from this side. One here. So I've seen a lot of social media influencers going to Chernobyl and taking pictures that are kind of scandalous and not very respectful. I'd like to know uh, your guys' opinions on the way they act and how it perceives the incident. Anyone else over here? All right, we'll do one more, if you don't mind passing it down. If renewable is cheaper, can, t can do 94% of the electrical needs that we have, what what's holding it back? Renewables. You, you did say, I think, that it could do 94% of what we have, and it's cheaper. So, so what, why are we trying to retain something that costs more money and is dangerous? Okay. And I think we did maybe have one more on this side, right down the back there. Okay, please raise your hand again. Oh, all the way back here. Yes, I guess, I guess my question is more a political one, but, you know, 50% of the power in Illinois comes from nuclear. You know, I've read things like half of oil and gas production in the United States would not be viable without subsidies. So there's an economic question. You know, socializing the losses. I mean, we did that with the financial crisis. So I think a lot of this gets to a political question of, you know, why is it that we can't properly regulate these things? And as you mentioned, strip out some of the emotion of this and actually try to fund things to see what is, what is it that we can do because we don't know where we can go with battery technology or nuclear technology or what the futures could, be, could look like. But we are in a crisis and we're not acting upon you know, that crisis. So what is it that we need to do from a political perspective to try to actually get, get a solution? Well, I think often technology does lead to politics. So if you have, if you invest in renewables, and this, uh, this is answering two questions at once, you decentralize power. And I think one of the reasons that we're being sold nuclear power as a solution, as what Greg says, a false solution, is because that power can be centralized in a, in a power plant and that money to be made can be centralized in a corporation that produces that power and then sold to us. But if we all have solar panels on our roofs, if we're all generating power happily, we, we're decentralizing and, and equalizing the, the profits to be made from that power. We're all sharing in that. And that is a model that doesn't work with capitalism right now. But if we change the technology, I think we'll start to change our society. We can lead technology first by decentralizing power, physical electrical power. We can decentralize and our our power structures, our political power structures, and our economic power structures. And, and what I hear in, from my read of American politics right now is that a lot of people are unhappy that that's getting too centralized, that, that money and power is getting too centralized in the hands of too few people. So through, I mean, amazingly, part, one way to have a revolution that's not violent is to change our technologies. And, and, and that's a sort of a beautiful, hopeful story, not, not, a, not, a, not a potentially scary one as we wonder when the next reactor is going to blow. Um, in terms of social media, there's, there's, um, Ukraine, I read the Ukrainian news, and, and every month there's somebody who's gone, who's a stalker, who see, you know, they play this online game, a shooting game that 200 million people around the world play, mostly young people, who shoot things, zombies in the zone. And uh, then they get so into it that they get confused between virtual reality and reality reality. And so they get all geared up and they go over the fence into the zone and they use Geiger counters to 
not to avoid radioactivity, but to get as close to it as possible. And then they find some you know, radioactive stream or apple, and then they take a selfie while they drink or eat it. And, and then, the, then as soon as they put it on social media, the Ukrainian cops catch them, and then they're hauled out. Why people do this? why there are 100,000 tourists this year to the Chernobyl zone, most of whom are young. And I, I mean, I go there, I've, I've been going there for years now, since 2004. Um, I've, more and more I see stag parties there. You know, just to lower the, 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 our, the in the northern hemisphere, the, the sperm count has dropped in half since 1945. Well, this is... <laughs> Not another kind of insurance policy. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Um, so the other questions, any other responses to...? I think the, the, to, the question about the social media and the way people perceive the place and the accident, uh, I think it, it is partly to do with the way in which, you know, kind of Western propaganda played into people's perception of the way the accident took place. Um, you know, because so many versions of the story have been told in which the victims of the accident are portrayed as, as, are portrayed as this kind of you know, robotic mass of cursed people marching together into a grim socialist future. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it, they've rarely been perceived as individuals who had real lives, that they lived before an accident in a town that was, you know, a really nice place to live. Um, so when I was reporting the book, you know, this is what I found, is that, that I was surprised from, because I was 17 when the accident happened. And I realized when I started meeting people, that my perception of them was the same. I expected them to be these kind of, you know, former Soviet robots. But actually, they, they were kind of, they were regular people who had hopes and expectations and liked living in the atomic city that they lived in, uh, you know, before it was covered with fallout. Um, and I think that people feel enabled to behave like that inside the exclusion zone and take these pictures because they don't really think of the individual people who lived there. So I think that's part of the reason that's happened. That was something I was at, kind of at pains to address in writing a book about it. Greg. I, I can just touch on the, the one question briefly on you know, why kind of renewables aren't taking off. I would, I would argue that they are. I mean, if you look at the last several years, the fastest growing energy source in the, or electricity sources in the US, it's been renewables. Um, if you look today, coal use is down from a high of about 60% of our electricity about 15 years ago to 30%. Now, natural gas has risen to meet some of that demand, but that's also been um, renewable. So the most electricity that's added to the grid nationwide over the last several years has been, has been, uh, has been renewables, uh, non-hydro renewables. Um, and so it is happening. It's not happening fast enough for what we really need. And it's happening right now, the race, as I said, is between gas and renewables, because gas is still relatively cheap. So that's where the real argument is, is how do you make, you gotta make gas a little bit more expensive, because we don't need any more gas. But gas has been doing its job in getting rid of coal, and renewables are getting rid of coal. And so it actually is happening, um, as I said, just probably not fast enough. So in the final minute we have, I'd like to return to um, Hollywood. And uh, this HBO series probably should have been called Inspired by a True Story. What should be made now that actually um, is the, the next miniseries that should win Emmys about this particular issue? I'd like to see a documentary series about Chanel. Yep, fair enough. <laughs> Kate. Um, wow, that's a great question. I mean, if, if, in terms of, uh, of drama, I mean, it would be... Um, It'd be nice to see actually sort of a, a story about people that sort of create a new kind of world that sort of skirt the nuclear disaster and go on in, in, in a hopeful way to, to create something that, that really is safe and provides prosperity and allows us to, to go on living the lives that we want to live with integrity and dignity. When I was chairman of the NRC, I always said there should be a TV show about the NRC. So I will stick by that, <laughs> where you get the blue vest and it says NRC on the back, and that's, that's what we need. <laughs>
That be like The Office, or uh... <laughs> right? <laughs> no, not like The Office. More like you know the FBI or something yeah, like right, that. Right? Okay, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I do understand that the Russians are making their own version of the series Chernobyl um, as as a sort of a counterpoint to what we've just seen. So I think that uh, stay tuned for that. It should be interesting. Um, so um, everyone, please join me in welcome uh, thanking the panelists. That was a really terrific discussion. And thank all of you for coming out.